Oh, welcome to the CES meeting. Today is May 3rd. Uh, and we have one, possibly two topics today. Uh, we have Guy today, who's been paging me in in my long absence on uh, what has changed in the last 12 weeks with regard to module harmony, specifically import attributes, nay, a ref, uh, reflection. Um, and if we have, uh, if our friends from MetaMask show up, we can also talk about uh, some changes to CES that would allow it to be shimmed in more environments. Um, Guy. Let's so I can give a, a brief um, overview of, of where we've got to recently with, with the import reflection proposal and, and the implications for uh, some of the implications for compartments, if they were worth discussing further. Uh, previously, we were looking at import reflection as not defining the object that is being returned for the source reflection phase of a module. So a module when it's uh, compiled, but not yet linked, executed, um, or instantiated. And uh, out of Jordan's feedback and, and then further discussions from there, we've been investigating uh, having an ECMID 262 defined object for the source phase that could provide ECMID 262 spec backing around what this object is so that when you're importing WebAssembly, you're not just getting a module that's entirely undefined by ECMA 262 or an object, a WebAssembly.module object. You, you can get something back that is um, has some definition in ECMA 262 and then also can be shared with JavaScript sources as well. And the approach we've kind of settled on for now is to define a shared base prototype an abstract um, module source prototype that all reflective source phase modules can uh, maintain in their prototype uh, chain. And uh, then also to define some internal slots on that so we can maintain host defined data um, and also uh, the, 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 a, a, a brand check through two string tag to be able to look up the name of the source class. So uh, for WebAssembly, it already has a WebAssembly.module object. The two string tag is already WebAssembly.module. But what we can do is potentially um, update its prototype to point to this new ECMA 262 base prototype and then uh, have a stronger branding check and some internal slots as well so that we have some stronger um, ECMA 262 defined spec properties and variants internal slots on, uh, on, on this object for WebAssembly.module. And then it will also uh, are looking at for JavaScript modules, we can expose a um, module source, which would also have that same shared prototype, but could also in turn have its own methods that would be unique to JavaScript source text and uh, using the same internal slot features. And uh, the, the reason we've been calling it minimal viable module source is because it would just do that and nothing else. So it'd be kind of kind of useless for now, but our options were either to throw for JS or to you know, build this common basis. And when you're building a common basis, there is value in um, being able to work through the first case because obviously the first case sets the precedent and so we if by defining a little bit of what js module source looks like we get the kind of convention set up for everything else and uh compartments have long had a module source so in the hope is that for the most part it opens the door to what compartments are already looking to achieve with module sources uh, in a way that can hopefully benefit both specs. And, and we, we're in a situation where further follow-ons can add features like the binding support, like the um, instantiation, which we're not currently defining. And also there's a third one, but it escapes me right now. Um, and so I, I can share the PR. We've been working on that, um, just working through some final details on it. Um, but we're trying to get some stage three reviews this week. And um, 
there it, it would form a um a, you know the, the initial integration point for compartments and so making sure we've worked through some of the questions on that um would be beneficial as well yeah so to recap so that i am uh the to, to recap my understanding and perhaps clarify some folks other for uh, details for other folks on the call um my understanding is that uh that there would be that instances of module sources of regardless of language would have an internal slot that identifies their language that would be revealed by the get uh, the two string tag on the module source shared prototype so if you were, wanted to do a brand check for any module source you would reach for the prototype and then call um or uh, uh it reach for the prototype and its two string tag accessor and apply that to an arbitrary object in order to for one determine that it is a module source of any, any kind in which case the uh the return uh, what you would you would get a string that identifies the type of module um and if it isn't a module at all you would get undefined this is similar in spirit to what we see with typed array today is that correct yeah the the model is um almost identical to what typed array does for its two string tag where uh typed array has a, a getter on the prototype that on the shared base prototype that checks the internal name slot and gives you the, the appropriate name so we have an internal slot which stores the class name so for WebAssembly, it would be webassembly.module for javascript it would be module source and uh returns that value and that allows the abstract module source prototype objects to string tag getter to be used as a generic brand checking function because it will check that internal slots and so you can rely on it as a um you know an unforgeable brand checker um and uh webassembly.module does already define to string tag today so it would either shadow that getter um without interfering with it or we could potentially remove the, the existing two string tag on WebAssembly.module so that it uses the one in the prototype chain. Uh, yeah, does that and answer the question? Yeah, that clarifies. And then the other, uh, the other thing that you said was that in this interim phase, there wouldn't be a job, there wouldn't be um, a module, a JavaScript module source constructor at all. There would just be the abstract prototype or the modules the shared module source prototype um, so that is that's a little bit up in the air what i the the our options were either to go either way on that so we could either have um a just abstract but as i was saying during the introduction one of the benefits of defining the js version is that it allows us in ECMA 262 to work through the first case, which makes the generalizations more obvious, of, you know, as opposed to treating WebAssembly as the first case. So even if it's useless, defining module source um, as a new global that uh, it, it has in its prototype, abstract module source prototype, allows us to kind of set the precedent and, uh, and the model. Um, so we can go either way on that. For now, I have written up how JS module source would look um, as the kind of first case. But if there are any concerns or objections, we could remove that as well. I, my personal feeling is that we could go either way as long as we satisfy. I, be, I believe I'm not sure how hard this requirement is, but I believe that the module source prototype, the shared prototype, that would be shared the, the prototype that would be shared by all module source constructors for each language um be accessible by traversal of properties starting with the global object and if the module source constructor is present then that's trivial um if the module source constructor is absent then um that would require the abstract module source prototype to exist 
<laughs> on to, to to be accessible by some other means from global from the global, regardless of whether WebAssembly is present. Um, so yeah, I think that that makes me lean a little bit on having an uh a uh, uh, and lean I I that leans me in favor of having a module source constructor that throws initially. Um, and like you said, that establishes a precedent for iterating on the design and also makes the prototype accessible from global. Yeah, so you, you would be able to read abstract module source through that prototype chain, you could get access to the generic two string brand check. Um, and we're able to kind of define the, the initial patterns and conventions around module sources. Um, there is the question of whether it, you know, if you're able to do import source for JavaScript, and get back this JavaScript module source, it would kind of be this kind of useless object uh, that that you wouldn't be able to do anything with. Like one vaguely useful property that it would have would it it would be able to act as like a a key in a weak map if you wanted some representation of the unique import attributes or identity of a module. So it would act as like a generic module identity. Um, Another vaguely useful thing is that, um, sorry, another possibly not so useful thing is that we're defining this new global module source that is uh, sitting on the global object. And again, kind of will not be useful because you try and create a construct an instance of it and it won't do anything. Uh, it'll just give you access to that branding check. Um, but the hope is that few further compartments proposals would be able to then build on that base and um, maybe have an easier time of you know piece by piece extending that functionality yeah i think so i think that's good um yeah uh on the side uh mark uh let me know when i got back that the the, the agoric folk had not found anything objectionable in um uh in the evolution of the module module harmony proposals while I was away, provided that when I review them, <laughs> that I don't find anything <laughs> troublesome. And uh and so far, uh I'm uh delighted by the progress that, that we've made, and I found nothing that would block us from making progress on um on the compartments evaluators agenda. Um, and also, I think that we, uh, I think that some of the things like the syntax for import attributes and, and decoupling phase from attributes um, is a good compromise. And the the extent to which the attributes complicate import hooks, I think, is acceptable. Um, and uh, and my question on the module call yesterday uh, was uh, how Justin felt about that compromise. <laughs> Um, and it would be great to give you an opportunity to to speak in your own words. Sorry, I'm only half listening. What was the question? Yeah. Um, so while I've been away, the import reflection proposals been turned into import attributes. And the what I what I've learned yesterday is that the way this is settled is that the phase the import phase, that is to say, source or uh, instance or deferred. Are uh, or asset even as a as a, an earlier phase are fully decoupled um, from import attributes and import import attributes are an extensible namespace under the with keyword, which is currently identical or which is which is uh, equivalent to the former assert, uh, you know, behaviorally equivalent to the former assert keyword, but with an extensible namespace where the keys and the keys and values of the with attributes bag are both strings and for the purposes of constructing a memo key they are uh in the, the keys are in lexically sorted order i didn't ask about which kind of lexical sort but i don't particularly care um as long as long as there's a consistent key um and uh this seemed to be like the middle ground in the three different routes that I could see us going, one of which being no further uh, no no further inputs in the import hook versus um, an ar arbitrarily expressive, um, possibly deep um, 
like a record or a record or tuple um, as uh, as participating in the memo key. And this, I think, is a fair middle ground, especially for now in the absence of records and tuples. And I was wondering whether this was satisfying to you and your needs for the purposes of bundling. Yeah, as long as the import attributes remains extensible and uh, we're allowed to put bundler specific keys into it that solves my primary use case. Um, I would still prefer if the import reflection, the evaluator, uh, was a part of attributes uh, because it's essentially how it's going to be implemented in bundlers. But it, in order to not block, we're just we're accepting the way it is where it's a, the module keyword. I'm sorry. So you're suggesting that you would have a, a, a light preference on having the phase expressed in the attributes? Yeah, as the same thing as an attribute, because the way it's going to be implemented in bundlers is as an evaluator attribute. It'll just change the source code of the thing that you import. Uh, I see. Okay. Uh, but I specifically not blocking on any of this. I The only thing that I will block on is uh, the import attributes making sure that is it extensible and that we are allowed to put non-specified keys into that. Okay, so I think that um, my my assessment's correct, that we've reached a, a happy compromise. Um, yeah, okay. So that's, uh, that's my take so far. Guy, did you have any other um, like questions that you wanted to bring up for things that haven't been nailed down? Um, and, and for one, also, Mark, um, uh, what, what's your take? Do you feel uh, uh, do you do you feel that I've got the right idea so far from what I've heard? Yes, and my my overall take is, I am so incredibly relieved you're back, um, <laughs> because yeah. hear, hearing you know hearing your reaction to things, it's you know it's kind of confirming you know, what I suspected, but I just didn't have confidence in it. Um, so it just is just really a relief to have you back and reacting to things and, and, and really going into all the implications for compartments and, and the future evolution of the API. So that's, I'm just having a strong emotional reaction. I don't have anything technical <laughs> to, to contribute at this point. Thanks, Mark. Um, I, I too am relieved. It sounds like my participation for the last 12 weeks has been entirely unnecessary. <laughs> Every, I've said, I think I've said all of my message and everybody's heard it and, and integrated it. And I'm very appreciative of that. Well, um, Chris, yesterday, when we asked you what you're expecting, you said that you weren't expecting us to have made any progress. So uh, I will, we'll add that as well. <laughs> that you, you were pleasantly surprised that we we were able to to achieve some some simplification. But yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm I am delightfully surprised. Not not extraordinarily surprised. You all are very competent people. Okay, um, very good. <laughs> just i started with low expectations deliberately um the uh you know, i was afraid that you were going to wait for me to make progress and that that i'm glad you didn't um the something that occurred to me yesterday during the module harmony call or rather a piece of feedback from jordan which i really appreciated was that when we get around to virtualizing module sources uh, Jordan expressed a preference for having a constructor rather than a protocol, um, which is to say uh, the equivalent proposal to the protocol, except that the object that defined the protocol would presumably be expressed as arguments to a module source constructor or a separate virtual module source constructor um, such that it could capture all of that behavior in a, in a, um, and, and, and validate it and capture it in, a, in internal slots of a, of a module source object that would pass a brand check, um, which is different than, than what I've been assuming so far for the compartments proposal, but also close to what XS already implemented in their prototyping. They have um, something, I, I don't recall whether it's specifically module source or whether they're still uh, riffing on the static module record jargon, but they did have a constructor that accepted the object that defined the behavior of virtual module sources. Um, and I think that they would be delighted by 
um, or I think that they would provide the same feedback and that this is that that moving in that direction would be um, good for consensus. Um, and I certainly don't have any reason to to object. Um, so that that that's another piece of progress uh, that uh, I, I need to take on and and edit the explainer for virtual module sources to uh, integrate. Um, I guess yeah. a couple of, a couple of other possible implications that could be working that could be worth working through. Uh, I guess you know we we formerly had attributes in the um, import hook. Um, and so now it would be attributes and phase in the input hook, I guess. Uh, or or uh, I, I, I wonder if there's a way to handle multi-phase input hook or something like that. That would be worth thinking through in more detail. I haven't thought about it too deeply myself. Um, and, my, yeah. um, my personal take on this is that the phase would not be seen in the import hook. Um, and that the import hook would consistently be required to return um, a module object, and the and the phase is intrinsic to the module object. Um, so if so, if a module if an import hook had to construct a module object from a whole cloth, it would be in uh, a relatively early phase. Um, having assets. As an earlier phase, um, uh, and eval as well, right? I mean, it would be uh, and, and defer. I mean, it would be interesting if you could have the importer uh, return something that is deferred and not yet fully evaluated. Yeah, the, the my expectation is that um, that the import hook should be able to return a module instance in the earliest possible phase. Um, the earliest possible phase as written today is um essentially parsed uh, i don't know what the name of the phase would be in this new uh, uh in in this new decoupling of phase because there already are phases in the spec and i'm not deeply familiar with them but the as, as the compartments proposal is written today it is not possible to construct a module instance in a phase earlier than that, that that precedes uh that that's earlier than having parsed the source and provided a, a source object um which is to say it can't produce an object uh, it can't produce a module at a phase or like at the asset like here's the text of the thing and i don't care what language it's in yet <laughs> that that doesn't exist um and isn't supported and, and as written in the explainer for for compartments um and whether it needs to be is also uh debatable um it would certainly need to be possible to have something earlier than that an asset phase if we had an import asset syntax um and that's something that we'll have to work out going forward it might be that uh it might be that the virtual module source or rather not the virtual module source but the import hook of a virtual module um, would need to be able to produce uh, an object that captures the asset and maybe even hints at how it will be treated in the future if it's imported as different types going forward. Yeah. Um, I haven't thought through that. An asset might not always be uh, possible to produce though. Uh, for example, like I assume an embedded system will not keep the original asset around. That's correct. And that's a good reason why module sources should not be able to, or rather um, should not be required to reveal their underlying text. Um, it, it, it needs to be possible for, for a bundler, for example, to um, not provide a mechanism for viewing the source of the, uh, of the, the original source of the underlying module. There might not be such a thing. I can roll up. If there were a roll up, there certainly wouldn't be one. Do you think that would be hand that could be handled similarly to how we're dealing with function sources now? I mean, Jordan mentioned yesterday there was that spec to hide function sources, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just wondering if if we would want to 
so right now you wouldn't be able to get the source text, but if we would want to be able to make it available in a way that could also be hidden, uh, mm -hmm. and if it might be worth a, trying to find out some kind of similar approach, because it seems like a similar problem space to functions. It is. It is like built-in modules don't have necessarily have a source. Um, module blocks could have a source, uh, or pardon, <clears throat> module. Oh, oh my, what are they called now? Declarations um, or expressions. Oh, declarations. Yeah. Um, and which one can take on lexically named dependencies? That's the declarations. Okay. So module declarations wouldn't necessarily be able to reveal an underlying source. Or rather, if they did, it wouldn't be sufficiently it wouldn't be a sufficient text to rehydrate the, yeah. the corresponding source. Um, yeah, so yeah, revealing text of modules is problematic. <laughs> and it, it, there are cases where it could be done, but it isn't important to any of our motivating use cases at this point. Um, so that's something we can punt safely. Or in another um question uh and initially when we're working through the two string tag things we um uh w the initial I, I was wondering if we should just have like a type getter or something and you just get a type string and then um we went back to the sort of more class name approach that you're getting the name of the class of the module subclass modules or subclass which is distinct from the language it was written in. For example, you can get a TypeScript can give you a source text module record. So if you have a module source, it would still be a module source class. Um, whereas in import attributes, you can set the type field and uh, you could be getting different types. And so there's some crossover, you know, CSS might, modules might want to have a CSS module source in future, we don't know. Um, so there's some crossover between types and the um, class of the module source. But there is also, um, you know, not necessarily complete crossover, but um, so in addition to the class name, you might still want to know the underlying type that was passed in import attributes. And so there might be a use case for actually providing an accessor to get the attributes on a module source. So for a given module source, you could get back its attributes or you know some of its original import metadata, which in theory could be part of the um, internal slots of the module source or or even rederived through the host metadata. So just to mention another another one while we're on the topic of interactions between these things um and and i know compartments does need to kind of think in terms of um a you know a, a transpile layer and and typing and metadata and uh so there may be a role in which import attributes could be exposed in that pipeline yeah i it's possible i struggle to imagine a motivating use case because for the purposes of the compartments proposal or rather just in general for the purposes of module harmony and linkage the role of a module source is sufficiently addressed by an opaque object um the you, the only or rather no not not an opaque object the there needs to be a way to analyze the bindings of a module source in order to write a bundler um, that, or, or, or rather to, to write a non-executing loader in general. Um, so really the only property that's, that is motivated by anything I know about so far is an analysis of the bindings of an arbitrary module source, regardless of how it arrived in module source form. 
right? The bindings are essentially universal, um, though some languages can express fewer bindings than JavaScript. The, um, the format of the bindings array can be common ground across languages. Um, because it's not an attribute of the language, it's an attribute of the linker. And the linker um, needs to be able to serve all languages. Yeah, that, um, I think working through those bindings use cases and, and um, if, it, if we can't figure out a way to do it that is cross, um, cross module type, great. Um, and you know, if, if other module types just don't aren't able to return the other variations, that seems fine. Yeah, um, I, the, so having reflection of the provenance, if you will, of the module source, like this came from these attributes, it went through these um, these uh, post-processing steps. Like if you have like even a WASM module is like, well, this was originally Rust. <laughs> Isn't interesting to the linker. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, I think that we can postpone that issue until there's a motivating use case. I just don't know what it is yet. So the the uh, WASM modules do have a um, binding array. As far as I remember, the semantics of what the binding array can express uh, is a conforming subset of the semantics of what the JavaScript module bindings binding arrays can express. Um, I, um, I don't remember for sure, but I, I, I suspect that there's nothing like an export star, uh, to be represented in the WASM module or module, you know, bond, bindings array. Um, the other weird difference, I'm just wondering whether if, if this, you know, how this impacts anything, uh, is there's a timing difference in the interpretation of these things, which is uh, the uh, the exports. Well, that's okay. The bindings are the bindings array is a static thing are are, are the same, but um, on linking the there are no values corresponding to the exports until uh the module in the module is instantiated with concrete values for the imports um and uh that's for example why uh cyclic uh import cycles among wasm modules are impossible um and uh does how does that claiming difference in the obligations of linking things together uh show up in the generic presentation of um, module sources to things like import hooks and such. I'm, I'm being very vague, I'm, I'm, but but this is reflecting my uncertainty. This is a better question for Guy to answer, but to be specific, what I understand so far is that um, the module, the WASM, the WebAssembly module object provides um, two methods one to get the imports array and one to get the exports or, or the, the imports data, the bindings information and whatever type and the exports binding and that they are separate and not interleaved, which is to say that the bindings array that can be expressed by a JavaScript more module be, can be more specific about the order, but, um, but the WebAssembly module is at least unambiguous. Like we could make a ruling that if you were to construct the bindings array from the information in a WebAssembly module, that you would do the imports and then the exports, and then it would be deterministic, essentially. I don't know if that answers your question, um, but I, maybe you can give it a shot too. Yeah, so WebAssembly modules don't have any of the, they don't currently have any of the same bindings flexibility uh, they don't have re-exports. They don't have export star. They don't um, currently have names namespace imports, or that they might effectively want to be doing something like that in future. And they do want source phase import uh, because WebAssembly modules want to be able to instantiate other WebAssembly modules. And um, 
that's you know a, a very useful um, feature of import reflection. That's kind of a, a WASM you know use case. Um, in in the bindings reflection, you would just basically just have the imports and exports as being direct. Um, WebAssembly.module does have its own bindings lookups, which also provide a type string for the bindings. Uh, so that there is this extra information. Um, so th that kind of justifies WebAssembly still having its own lookup information on bindings. But if you want to define a general linker, having a, a base version of, of getting the imports and exports to know how to link it also seems beneficial. Um, but yeah, from a, an environment initialization perspective, um, WebAssembly modules don't currently define their bindings like JS does as um, uh, early in the in the instantiation phase, but only at execution time. Uh, like there, there might be possibility to do better things there. It's difficult to know, um, but because of the structure of the spec, source text module record is given you know priority in the binding system in that it has these sort of more expressive bindings and then the the lower level cyclic module record and abstract module record have um you know less of the functionality respectively um there, there may well even be spec refactorings to better generalize bindings between languages to be able to share more of those benefits um but at the very least, uh, so far as all other module source semantics are a subset of what JavaScript can do, uh, at, at least there's not a situation where, um, you know, where I, I don't think it leads to any, any particular issues right now, um, but also it's something that could be worth investigating further. Okay. Oh, uh, thanks. I think that's that's as much clarity as I need now. Yeah. I think one way to put this would be that we haven't yet found a language that needs to be able to express bindings that JavaScript can't. Right. In a way, common JS. Uh, uh, is such a language, but we've all uh, decided to live with uh, the the best fit we can make of common JS into um, uh, ECMAScript modules, uh, and I, I think that that's that's the best we're going to do. So that's fine. That was never an obvious decision, and it's quite interesting how it kind of became one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, interesting it? how much those in the space of, you know, discussing interop are unaware of the history of of the fact that there was such effort made to, to integrate CommonJS into the ECMAScript in, interop from the start. And it, it often gets read as, as that, you know, ES modules almost get seen as a little bit hostile to CommonJS when, in fact, there's this whole history of attempts and, and a lot of work to closely integrate them. Uh, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and say that, you know, having seen the history, I believe both sides of that, that there has been a lot of, you know, a lot of good faith work for uh, for many, many years uh, to, to integrate them, and that's great. Uh, but also say that uh, ECMAScript modules were born initially out of hostility to the common JS module design. So there, there's kind of a hostility in design from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I don't drink, but I invite you to do whatever you think is equivalent to get me to tell you that story off the record. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to bring up old wins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly the hostility there is um, is 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 ancient history at this point. 
yeah, uh, so it certainly does, isn't likely to affect an outcome, I think. Um, yeah, the yeah the uh, the other the other common misconception I think is that Common JS uh, folks tend to infer that Common JS was not intended to be used on the web. Um, yeah, that's that's not accurate. <laughs> but uh, the folks seem to Im Im infer that because it became popular because of Node, that Node was the the that it was designed for Node, which isn't true. Yeah. yeah so just I mean, I just fill in a little bit of history here for the record without getting into the the unpleasantness. Um, uh, uh, Chris, together with uh, E. Habawad, um, uh, co presented the ancestor of the common JS module proposal uh, as a very elegant, very JavaScripty uh, module proposal presented at 2TC39 uh, a very, very long time ago. Chris, you might remember the year. Um, yeah, that was 2009. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go ahead and proudly say that uh, the E uh, module system called the eMaker system um, uh, was some of the inspiration for that design. Uh, and that design uh, was designed to be universal module system for JavaScript, obviously not just for Node, this, being, this preceding the existence of Node. Um, and the, uh, I remember part of the proposal was that the require, uh, that the argument to it had to be a literal spring so that uh, require could basically be treated as a pseudo keyword so that you could do all of the asynchronous loading ahead of time. In other words, all of the, the um, uh, static requirements needed to do the, the preloading that the ECMAScript module system eventually uh, produced. The um, common JS in um, moving into node at some point dropped the requirement on require which led to their violation of the event loop system uh, in going to, out to the um, file system synchronously with the computed name, which was, I always thought, quite horrible. Okay, enough, enough yeah. history, unless Chris wants to add anything. Yeah, I, I would say that in 2010, I came back and proposed the ECMAScript just that that hey node happened and clearly this does have legs that's what we wanted to learn from this <laughs> and what uh, we proposed that we just change the word require to import um and do something about on the export side so that it would be strictly statically analyzable and that the language would enforce it would enforce that stringly stringiness of the um of the argument and otherwise leave the semantics identical to common js and the idea was specifically for there to be a graceful migration path and also to take advantage of Dave Herman's work on destructuring um, because that would have improved that, that 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 didn't exist at the time but was anticipated as uh, a way to essentially recover what we get from the import syntax um, but the thing that that path could not do was leave the door open for hygienic macros in the language um, that's why we have ESM as it is today. It does leave the door open for hygienic macros. And it doesn't use property structuring and um, the details of the structuring syntax also led to the interrupt issues with CommonJS. Yes. Yeah, well, anyhow. Um, so we're in a position where common JS can't perfectly be emulated and there and especially because the because of the destructuring issue the there is there is no perfect match um yeah well, and the original proposal didn't account for module exports assignment which is what you I think Yehuda Katz's uh contribution some years later was to um compromise ESM so that there was at least some path albeit an imperfect one. But yeah, that's also history. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, uh, we're at 10 till, uh, and it seems like we've exhausted this topic. Thank you again, Guy, for uh, bringing me up to speed and, um, and for everyone here for 
uh, your participation in this conversation. Um, and I think I'll call that the meeting. Thank you. If pe yeah, if people want to stick around after the recording's off, I'll, I'll have another word to say. <laughs>